uh, I'd like to talk about how to do bridge modeling in HC Res um, for 1D hydraulics. Okay. We're going to talk about some model limitations. We'll talk about what does flow look like through real bridges. Um, we'll talk about how to locate our cross sections, and then we'll spend a little bit of time about uh, what does contraction expansion look like, and how do we set the coefficients to properly account for those losses through the bridge. And then we'll spend the last part of the presentation discussing how to establish ineffective flow areas um, for high flow uh, bridge modeling situations, or actually for low flow bridge modeling situations. We want them to be turned off for a high flow. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, we have lots of references for you. A lot of the data that I'm going to pull from um, for this presentation is from RD42, um, where the old, uh, I guess I shouldn't say old, the previous team lead for HC RAS um, did some sensitivity analysis, regression analysis on hypothetical bridge situations in order to come up with some of the coefficients that we're going to see in the presentation. We're trying to do these computations in one dimension. 1D steady flow. Everything's in one dimension. Okay? Is a bridge, if you walk up to a bridge during a flood situation, is that bridge, is the flow going through the bridge acting like 1D flow? No, right? You've got contraction into the bridge. You've got turbulence going on. You've got recirculation zones, upstream and downstream. You have all, all sorts of things. It's really a three-dimensional problem, and we're trying to estimate it using 1D calculations. So um, we're going to try and identify where those losses are coming from and how to estimate them. So here's a pretty picture of a bridge. Uh, this was done in RAS in 2D. Um, this is the type of situation that we're going to look, look at, right? We have flow going this direction. How do we know? Does anybody know why flow is going that way? Just by looking at the picture? Because of the visual of the right upper and the right lower corner. Yeah, you can see the recirculation zones, right, on the downstream side. You can also see flows contracting um, at one side and expanding on the other. And <clears throat> if we didn't have tracers on there, you would know this was the contraction side because water contracts typically much more quickly, more rapidly than it expands. Okay? You might want to think about that for later today. Here's another example of a bridge, just so you can start to get the idea that it's not a 1D situation. We have a bridge, and we have flow contracting through the bridge opening and then going down through. And you can see the bulging water surface profile um, as water's contracting. If we laid out a cross section up here, clearly we're not going to have a horizontal water surface, right? So you'll see the drawdown into, into the bridge. You'll see through the bridge, our contours are not nice and evenly spaced. Um, and then down on the downstream side, if we were to take a section through here, again, you would see a higher water surface on one side than the other. So we're trying to represent this situation with some idealized 1D model. And so there's some, um, some limitations when we do that. And then lastly, just, just to um, highlight doing two-dimensional modeling, here's the, another bridge uh, where we developed a 2D model for the bridge. And you can see the contraction zone into the bridge and the expansion zone out. You can see that this is a highly um, obstructed floodplain where the bridge opening size is very small compared to the total width of the floodplain. And so that's, it's acting kind of like a jet through here, pushing water downstream before it actually is able to expand. Um, but I think that gives you a good visualization of what a bridge looks like in real life, okay? So we're gonna try and talk about how do we lay out our cross sections to re represent this uh, flow regime through a bridge, this contraction and this expansion zone. So the way we talk about bridges and RAS is we always talk about this modeling approach as having six cross sections. So when we talk about bridges, we'll always talk about cross section one, cross section two, cross section three, cross section four, and then these other cross sections that we call BU and BD. Okay. Cross section one, when we refer to it as cross section one, or another word to say is that's our fully expanded cross section. 
So it's on the downstream side. It's where flow has gone back to natural river flow where we don't have any contraction or expansion. Foot flow has been fully expanded. Okay. Cross section two is the cross section the le um, that is just downstream of the bridge where it doesn't know anything about the bridge. It's a cross section uh, through the floodplain that doesn't know the bridge is there. But this cross section during low flow is going to be fully contracted. There won't be any flow in the overbanks because the bridge will have gotten in the way of water passing downstream. Does that make sense? Okay, cross section three is going to be a sister to cross section two, but it'll be on the upstream side. It'll be the last cross section before we get to the bridge where it's seeing the full floodplain unobstructed from any embankment. And flow is, um, we'll say fully contracted, it's not fully contracted, but it's, it's almost fully contracted before it goes through the bridge opening. Because at this point, any flow that was gonna go through cross section three and the overbanks, it would hit the bridge embankment. Right? And then cross section four is going to be our fully expanded flow somewhere upstream before um, flow starts to contract and go through the bridge. Does that all make sense so far? We've talked about four cross sections and all of them have been laid out, um, I want to say irrespective of the bridge being there. So these cross sections, one, two, three, and four, they're full cross sections the terrain is unaltered based on the bridge, okay? So two and three don't have any of the bridge information in them. And then we also, RAS is going to add two cross sections interior for bridge computations. We call those bridge downstream and bridge upstream or BD and BU for short. These cross sections are gonna end up being a copy of two and three. So cross section two gets copied and then we um, enforce the bridge deck onto BD. And then BU is a copy of cross section three, but we enforce the bridge deck onto BU, okay? And so depending on which um, bridge modeling method we're using, we'll be doing different computations through those six cross sections but it's important to understand that fully developed flow, fully contracted flow, these are our interior cross sections in the bridge that have the bridge deck um, on the cross sections, fully contracted flow, and then um, fully unobstructed flow. Okay? So we've got cross section one, two, our bridge. Three, four. And so if we were to look at the profile through those, just the invert profile, we'll have our invert for four, our invert for three, um, our invert for two, and our invert for one. And so our profile would be connected. Well, I, as we just talked about, we're going to insert two cross sections. And the way we do that is we take this, this node and we're going to copy it some distance upstream. And we're going to take number three and we're going to copy it downstream. So if your bridge is on a significant slope, what you can end up doing is having your profile that's on slope and then it gets flat right before the bridge. And then there's a steep drop through the bridge between cross sections BU and BD. Okay. I don't want you to get overwhelmed by this right now, but I want you to be aware that that's how the, the data gets copied in. It's a pure copy, and that cross-section is just moved upstream or downstream, depending on the distance that you say cross-section three is away from the bridge. Okay, so if this uh, cross-section, is, we'll say it's 20 feet, then this cross-section is gonna get copied downstream 20 feet. And if this cross-section is 20 feet, then this is going to be copied upstream 20 feet. And so then this distance between these nodes is going to be whatever the width of the bridge is. Okay? Why is that important? 
because you're going to look at your model and maybe Raz is going to compute a profile that's going to get up here and then it's going to have to rapidly change going through the bridge and maybe that's not where the invert of the bridge should be. Maybe the invert of the bridge should actually be <clears throat> on that same slope, which would mean you would take the BU, the downstream cross section, and elevate the invert a little bit, and then BD and you drop it a little bit. Okay, that's a little bit more advanced modeling, but if you get into bridge modeling problems, that's oftentimes um, a problem we have with really steep river reaches. Cross-section one is sufficiently downstream where we're back to full flowing cross-section, okay? That's important to know. But the first question people ask is, well, but what if I want, what if my floodplain is changing between cross-sections one and cross-section two, what do I do? It's okay, it's just the way we talk about bridge modeling. You, you can still insert additional cross-sections. Not a problem, okay? Now, in the old, old days, we were really concerned with how far away this cross-section needed to be because we went out and surveyed data. So we did some research, um, referring back to RD42, about how far away that cross-section needed to be before it was fully flowing. Because here you can see we would need to block out this area and this area within effective flow areas. And then here we're going to pretend that it's fully flowing, even though my picture doesn't quite show that. Um, but then for the cross sections in between, we would also need to block out some of this ineffective area that's in the recirculation zone, right? So one thing that we wanted to know is, well, how fast is water going to expand? And so um, some research was done on idealized bridge systems. And based on the slope of the channel, based on the obstruction, so this is the opening width to the total floodplain. So this is a, a very obstructed, right? Ratio of bridge opening width to total floodplain width. So this is a 10% opening. So this is very obstructed to not very obstructed. And then based on the end values in the overbank to the channel, came up with um, some regression analysis to figure out how long it's gonna take for things to expand. What we found is that the expansion ratios, so this would be ratios, we're about somewhere between one to two times the opening width, okay? So here in this picture, we're showing that it's expanding at about, I don't know, a one to two or a one to four ratio. In general, for expansion, it's gonna be for every foot you go downstream, it's, gonna, it's going to, sorry, for every two feet you go downstream, it's going to expand one foot. So a two to one ratio is a good ratio to start with. If you really need to know, a 2D model is a great tool for figuring out what water will look like as it expands out of your bridge. So ratio of about two to one is a good ratio. If you want to be more mathematical about it, uh, the, the regression equations that were developed are provided in RD42. And you can see that the length of the expansion zone is based on this regression equation if you need an estimate, it's based on the fruit number in cross-section one and two. Okay, so what does that tell you? This expansion length is based on the ratio of the velocities at cross-section one and cross-section two, which makes sense, right? So the higher the velocity, the higher the ratio of velocities at velocity, higher the higher the ratio of velocities at cross-section two compared to one the longer the expansion reach. So another way to look at this is the larger the jet, the longer it takes for the water to expand. Slow water going through a bridge will expand very rapidly. Water that's going through the bridge very rapidly on a steep slope will take longer to get out into the overbanks. Does that all make sense? <laughs> pretty, pretty straightforward, intuitive. Um, came up with an expansion rate uh, equation and as you can see the expansion rate it hovers right around two um, these were a lot of the data is, is between one and two but two is a very good um, benchmark in previous days the guidance would have been if you were doing H2 modeling the, the guidance would have been to have an expansion ratio of four to one 
Um, but that, that tends to be too long unless you're in a really, really steep, really constricted system. Okay, so we talked about cross-section one is fully expanded, so it doesn't have any ineffective flow areas on it. it cross-section two is gonna be just downstream of the bridge. It's not going to feel any of the, the elevation differences or the bridge deck or anything. So you're gonna place cross-section two and you're gonna place your expansion, uh, sorry, your ineffective flow areas. How do we place those ineffective flow areas spatially? Well, if water is expanding at a ratio of, we'll say, one to one, to make the math easy right now, if the distance from the bridge deck to this cross section is 10 feet, then we would want these 10 feet away from the opening. Does that make sense? Okay, so if my expansion ratio is two to one and I'm 10 feet downstream, how far from should these be set back? Five feet. Okay. And then if we have additional cross sections downstream, we're going to want to set those ineffective flow areas. Okay. Again, trying to visualize what the water is doing as it's coming out, how fast it's going to expand. Cross section three is going to be the sister to cross section two, where it's going to be upstream of the bridge. Um, typically, I tend to center uh, my bridge in between my cross sections. So if this cross section was 10 feet downstream, this one will be 10 feet upstream. Uh, be away from the bridge. I'll set my ineffective flow areas based on my contraction ratio. Contraction ratio t of one to one tends to be very appropriate. Water contracts very, very rapidly. Um, and so we tend to use a contraction ratio of one to one. We have good results, which should be, well, I guess we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, and then we're gonna have cross sections BU and BD, which will be internal, and they will be a copy of the external cross sections, but they'll actually have whatever bridge deck information you provide to describe the bridge. Okay, so whatever that blocks out part of the floodplain, those part of the cross sections will be brought, blocked out. And then again, if you don't like uh, the, the, the fact that we're making a copy of this upstream cross section, like maybe, maybe you're in a, an area where the bridge has been um, designed, like gone in and hardened, um, you can go in and, and shape it. So you can, you can edit the actual cross section and change the shape of it. Okay, and then upstream of that cross section, you can have an additional ineffective flow areas if you need additional cross sections. Um, between cross section three and cross section four, and four will be that fully, fully flowing cross section. Okay, so now we're going to talk about contraction uh, links. Um, for the idealized bridge scenarios that were run, um, you know, 100 or 1,000 different runs. Regression equations based on the slope of the channel, based on the end values in the overbank and the, and the main channel, you can see most of the numbers hover around one. One's a really good uh, contraction ratio. And if we look at this, you can see water is, this is a pretty steep uh, model. You can see water still contracting pretty rapidly. And so a one-to-one -one ratio is normally pretty good. If you wanna get some actual mathematical distances, there's some regression equations you can use to estimate how long the contraction reach is going to be. Um, and as you can see, this is lying on about a 45 degree line where the observed was about what was predicted with the regression equation. So it's about one to one. Contraction rate equation, again, we're hovering right between one and one and a half. So those are contraction expansion ratios. So quick test, you're setting up a bridge model. You don't know what numbers to use. What are you going to use for your contraction rate? One to one. one to one. For expansion, what are you going to use for your default if you don't have any inf other information? Two to one. You're in a really flat river with a big, big bridge opening um, where it's not too constrictive. You can probably get away with one to one and it'd be absolutely okay. And those, uh, those rates of expansion and contraction are important because you're going to go into your bounding cross sections and you're gonna set your ineffective flow areas so that you can um, 
block out those areas of recirculation around, around the bridge, okay? As part of the cross-section uh, data entry, you know, you've, you've provided uh, reach links, you've provided bank station information, you also have to provide a contraction expansion coefficient. Does everybody remember where we use that contraction expansion coefficient? So we talked about the energy equation yesterday twice. Part of the energy equation, we're going to predict our energy loss from one cross section to the next. Part of the energy loss is our friction term, length times uh, friction slope, plus the contraction expansion losses, right? And so there's that coefficient that we multiply times the absolute change in velocity head. Okay, and so we need a value for that C. Now for um, expansion losses that we saw through the idealized bridges, you can see they, they ranged. There was a, a certain range um, where they ranged from 0.1 all the way up to maybe 0.5. And then for the contraction rates, we saw not, not quite as big a change. And that makes sense, right? With the expansion zones, they tended to vary a little bit. So depending on whether the bridge was very efficient or not, it either take a long time for the flow to expand or expand rapidly. But for contraction rates, we saw that they were fairly constant. And so um, while the average was around uh, a tenth, depending on the degree of constriction, so for a highly constrictive bridge, we were seeing higher values. And then for a normal bridge that wasn't too highly constrictive, uh, default value of 0.1 was accepted. Okay, so for a highly constrictive bridge, um, we might raise our contraction coefficient up to like 0.3. And for a highly constrictive bridge, we might see an expansion ratio up in the range of 0.5. Does anybody remember what the default contraction expansion values are in RAS? So let's talk about contraction first. What's the default contraction coefficient that we use in RAS? Remembering that we want to lay out our cross sections so that we have a gradual transition from cross section to cross section. The default in RAS is 0.1. And then the default expansion coefficient is 0.3. Okay, because expansion is a little uh, less efficient. You have more losses. Okay, same for bridges. For bridges, if you're going to have a, uh, a constrictive bridge, we might raise that uh, coefficient from 0.1 up to 0.3. And for expansion, we'll, we'll tend to raise it from 0.3 to 0.5. Let's talk about setting our ineffective flow areas. So setting our ineffective flow areas used to be a lot harder because we couldn't do it, we couldn't do it spatially. You had to just set them on the cross sections. But now if you can visualize something like this picture, in RAS Mapper should be fairly easy for you to, right? We did that workshop yesterday where we did it by hand and we just kind of, we could trace it, we could visualize how flow is going to move based on the terrain, right? Well, we can do the same thing um, now geospatially in plan view using Mapper, we can visualize how flow is going to contract into the opening and expand. And really our only limitation is lack of experience. If we do, do a whole bunch of different, um, a whole lot of br bridge modeling, pretty soon you'll start to get a feel for, okay, my bridge is super constrictive. This is what it's more going to look like, and it, um, or this is this bridge opening is hardly going to feel anything. We'll be contracting, expanding very rapidly. You'll start to get uh, experience with that. But if we can visualize this in plan view, now you can go in and you can set your ineffective flow areas on your cross sections pretty easily, right? We don't need to worry about contraction and expansion equations and all that stuff. You can just visualize it and set it in RAS Mapper. So you'll have to take some picture like this in your head and visualize what's going to happen. And then based on this picture, you'll be able to set your ineffective flow areas on your cross sections. So you can do that in RAS Mapper, but eventually you're going to have to set not only the stationing, 
or the left and rightness, you're going to have to set an elevation for when to turn those off. Okay. The ineffective flow areas, we're going to use those during low flow because during low flow, flow is going to come down, hit the bridge, turn, and go through the bridge. Well, what happens during high flow? During high flow, the water that's over here hits the bridge and then it goes over the top, right? So we, we don't want to have those ineffective flow areas active because <coughs> during high flow, the, full, the whole cross section is flowing full. So when we go to set these, this is your bridge editor and you're gonna learn this afternoon how to enter data, into, in, how to enter the bridge deck data into RAS. But once you have your, your deck in there, now you can visualize where the opening is, and you can start to visualize on the bounding cross section where should that ineffective flow area be. And so if you need to set it by hand, you can access the bounding cross sections through these quick links on the bridge editor and start setting the station and the elevation. And the elevation is what you really need to do um, in this profile view from the bridge editor because these trigger, uh, the elevation for these ineffectives, you want them to turn off once water goes over the top of the bridge. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to visualize when the water surface is high enough on the upstream end to turn these off, what does the water surface look like on the downstream end to turn off the ineffective flow areas? So if we go back to our hypothetical bridge over here, and we look at it in profile view. So there's my bridge deck. And we have our water surface that comes down. During low flow, it might look like that, right? Does it hit the bridge deck? And then at some point, it'll pressurize and go sluice flow. And then eventually, the tail water will submerge the downstream side and we'll have full orifice flow. And then eventually if, if flow gets high enough, it'll come up, go over the top of the bridge, go through weir flow, and keep going downstream. Which one of those profiles do we want to use to turn off the ineffective flow areas? The low flow one? Second one? Weir flow. Third one? Not until you have weir flow, right? So we're gonna use this upstream profile or the, sorry, the highest profile to turn on and off these ineffective flow areas. And we want to set them at an appropriate elevation so that once it gets high enough and goes over the bridge deck, these guys go away and we can have flow flowing through the full cross sections. Okay. So what, what do we use for the elevations? Well, it's going to be an iterative approach and you're going to have to run your model several times to figure out when does my bridge get overtopped? And what does that profile look like? Because my profile could look like that, or it could look like that, or it could look like that. Like There's a whole bunch of different things. We don't know how much head loss we're gonna get through the bridge, right? So we don't know how, how low this the downstream side is gonna be. Upstream side, we can be fairly certain that the water has to go over the top of the bridge. This is the uh, only tricky thing of this presentation, is that in order to turn off the ineffective, um, ineffective flow areas, the trigger elevation is going to be based on the water surface elevation. Okay? So let's take away this profile. <coughs> The elevation that is turning on or off this ineffective flow area is going to be based on the water surface. So you need to understand what the water surface is going to do as it goes through the bridge. Now I said this was tricky. Does that seem very tricky to you? That's not very tricky. Okay, the tricky part is weir flow. say RAS, computed weir flow, is computed based on the energy grade. 
Okay. Energy grade line, EGL. So let's do a zoomed in picture of this. When does this water surface profile go over the top of the bridge? In an idealized case. It goes over the top of the bridge when your energy grade goes over the top of the bridge. Because what happens to the water surface when it hits the bridge? It's, it's going to rise, right? It's going to stop because your velocity is going to tend towards zero. And so you're going to lose all your velocity head. It's all going to go to to the energy grade line, right? Remember, we have to always think about this all week long. So when the water surface hits the bridge deck, the velocity is going to tend towards zero. If it's tending towards zero, all your energy is in static head. So that means your water surface is really going to, in real life, it's going to rise to meet the energy grade. And so the way RAS computes weir flow, it uses it based on the, the head, based on the energy grade. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that when we set our ineffective flow areas, our ineffective flow areas can't be to the top of the bridge because when the energy grade is over the top of the bridge, the water surface tends to be below the top by a half a foot or a foot or something. So our energy grade line trigger elevations on the upstream side will tend to be lower than the top of the, the bridge deck by some measurable amount. And you won't know what that amount is until you run the RAS model and look at the output. And then on the downstream side, obviously, it's going to be way below the top of the deck because the downstream side of the water surface, the downstream side of the bridge, the water surface will be much lower. Typically, you'll have a couple feet of head drop across the bridge. OK, so this is what it's going to look like to you when you're setting it up. You've got your bridge deck. You've got your upstream cross-section with your ineffective flow areas. You've got your downstream cross-section with your ineffective flow areas. And your job as a hydraulic engineer is to make sure that for the profile that doesn't overtop the bridge, they both stay on. And then once the um, bridge is overtopped with the water surface profile, they both turn off in unison. Because it's not going to make sense if you turn off this one, but that one's on, right? That would mean this cross-section is flowing full, but that cross-section isn't and vice versa. We want those to turn off together. So what does that look like for a non-overtopping -over profile? In the cross-section plot, you'll see the cross-hatching, which means no effective flow in the overbanks. Velocity is zero. And you'll see the water surface line below the top of the energy grade, uh, below the top of the trigger elevations. And then for one where it's overtopping, they will turn off. They won't be cross-hatched. That means you have conveyance in the overbank areas want to make sure that these guys turn off in unison. So if you see a plot here where your upstream end is open like this and conveying and then this one's cross hatched, that's that's not that's not a consistent bridge solution, right? If water's flowing in the overbank upstream, then you want it flowing in the uh, overbanks downstream. Okay. So we have pre pictures to help you with this, but we also have tables and you're going to this is um, one of those times you're going to have to refer to the tables. And so the bridge only table is going to show you uh, what solution was selected. It'll show you the energy grade. It'll show you the water surface. Um, it'll show you the amount of weir flow that RAS computed. And that's what I use it for the most is for this overtopping profile. How much weir flow did I have? Why do I care? Well, I care because I want to make sure that the amount of flow I have in the overbanks that goes over the top of the bridge is approximately equal to the amount of weir flow that RAS computes. Right? We want to have uh, conservation of mass through the bridge. Um, so we're going to use the, 
the six bridge um, or the bridge only table to check for continuity with the six bridge table. So I have two screenshots of it. This is a better screenshot. Um, these are the cross sections that we've talked about. Cross section one, cross section two, BD, BU, three and four. And so it shows you the bounding cross sections around the bridge. And you'll be able to go into those, see what the energy grade was, see what the water surface is. So from that you can figure out if you have high velocity. Um, and then you can go in and you can see the flow in the left overbank, the channel, and the right overbank. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that in this case, um, my total flow was 14,000. So we go through and of the 14,000, we have 4,000 left over bank on this cross section, three in the channel and six in the right. And as we get closer to the bridge, you can see it's contracting and going into the, the bridge. And then as we get to the bridge, now we can see we have most of the flow in the bridge opening, but we still have some in the overbank. We still have some in the overbank. Okay, well we want these guys, these numbers, to help balance with the amount of weir flow we're getting. All right, so let's draw a picture. That's our bridge. And we're gonna make up some numbers. How much flow would you guys like? 30,000 PSI. 30,000. All right, you, how much of that is going into weir flow? Ten percent. So we have thirty thousand CFS, and this is what my cross section looks like just upstream. Imagine there's no bridge. How much do we think we have in each each portion of the the cross section? So how much is in our leftover bank? Do we think? One thousand. Put very much out over there. That's okay. That'll work out perfectly. So if we have a thousand over there, then I'm going to put a thousand over here. That seems fair, right? Kind of. We have a mirror. So then that means that um, we have twenty-eight thousand going through the bridge opening. Okay. Does that all make sense? Okay. So we've got a thousand in this overbank. We've got a thousand in this overbank because everything seems to have contracted and gone through our bridge opening. Which actually, I like these numbers a lot. They work out great. How much weir flow should we have, knowing we have a thousand CFS in the right, left overbank and a thousand CFS in the right overbank? How much flow total should be going over the weir? Well, this thousand should be going over this portion of the weir. Right? Does that make sense? This thousand should be going over this portion of the weir. How much is going over this portion of the weir? Probably about a thousand, right? Because these are all equal segments. So it should be 2,000 plus 1,000, which happens to equal 3K. That's why I like the numbers. That's why this, this number was a great starting number. Everything worked out splendidly. So when we're doing this idea of conservation of mass through the bridge, that's what we're looking for. We're looking to see that the cross section just upstream of the bridge, what was in its overbank, most of it is going to go over the top through weir flow. You might be able to contract a little bit more to get into the bridge. Most of what's out here is going to go over the bridge, right? There's not much more room to contract. Does that make sense? Because it's just upstream of the bridge. And then, if uh, so, who knows the weir flow equation? Some coefficient times some length. I heard the rest of it. Okay, so if we're looking at the weir equation, it's based on the length of the weir times the head. And the head we're assuming is constant. So we need to proportion it out based on whatever weir length we have available to us. Okay, so if we said this is one third L and this is one third L and this is one third L. And we said we had a thousand and a thousand, then that means, well, we probably have a thousand going over here. Raz will tell you this number and Raz will tell you this number and Raz will tell you this number. 
And you have to infer this last number based on the length of the weir and proportionaling it out, okay? So that's the hard part about doing bridge modeling. In the end, you're going to have to do your own mass balance using the tabular output and the geometry of your bridge. Okay, so this is, this is the hard part of bridge modeling. After you've done your modeling and you've laid out your geometry, you've selected your bridge modeling approach, which we're gonna talk about next. Then you have to run your model and you have to go back and decide, are the numbers that I'm getting, do they make sense from a conservation of mass standpoint? And that's, that's the hard part. And so what would happen if we had way too much flow out here? What, let's say Raz came back and said, this should have been 4,000 and 4,000. But we still only had 3,000 of weir flow. What would we do? The ineffective flow areas have turned off, so they're no longer part of the game. What do we have at our disposal to reduce the conveyance out in the overbanks? <coughs> Manning's end values. So our Manning's end values, because you'll notice the bridge solutions are not too sensitive with the rear coefficient that you use. That's all I'm saying. The, the knob that you have is your Manning's end value. So you'll be able to increase that to bring the flow down to an appropriate number. That's really the best knob you have available to you. So we have our geometry, we have our tables. Um, we're gonna make sure that our ineffective flow areas remove conveyance during low flow and that they get turned off during high flow. Um, we wanna make sure they turn off in unison. So bounded cross sections, you treat them as kind of one unit. If we need to control flow in the bounding cross sections, Manning end value is our friend. That's what we use to slow flow down. Um, and then if we're using the solution that has pressure weir flow, and you're gonna find out there's two different methods for high flow, you can use an energy method or pressure with weir flow, then you're going to need to be consistent with the uh, overbank flows and the amount of weir flow you're getting by doing a, a conservation of mass type of thought process through the bridge. Okay. Um, just so you can get an idea of what water is going to do as it goes over a bridge, here's a little video where we went to the UC Davis and did a lab. And uh, you guys can just admire it while I check and see what we're doing next. Um, and as you can see, um, you can see that water, there is no area where water doesn't get over the bridge. So we laid um, out some different inclines, pretending the bridge of embankment, so that we could see that water would in fact climb. You can see there's a little bit of dead space there, but um, not too much, oops, that went too far. No, wait, I wanna go to three minutes. There we go. So even if there's no embankment around the bridge, you'll see that the water will still climb and go over the face of the bridge. Even, and you'll see um, there's just a little bit of dead dead zone down here, but eventually water does get up over the top. So there's my bald head. Um, so we sometimes folks ask, well, should I make those areas permanently ineffective behind bridges? And the answer is no. You can see water is going to climb and get up over the top of uh, bridge the roadway crossings. Um, what we tend to need to do is just increase Manning's end values a little bit around the bridge to slow the water down. But as you can see from the die trace, that die, it climbs up over the top pretty easily. So is that important? What's that? You slow the mixture, or increase the Manning's end on the cross section directly upstream of the bridge? Yeah, directly upstream and directly downstream. So I just wanted to show you that. Sometimes people need to see it to, to believe it. All right, so that's it for the bridge presentation.